I'm uh, Dr. Kevin Mills. I work in the uh, English department here at Glamorgan. Um, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about theory. We've all heard of uh, Darwin's theory of evolution, uh, or the part of the driving test that focuses on theory. In the first example, the case of Darwin, theory refers to a mode of scientific explanation. In the second, it serves as a contrast with practice. So nothing scary there, right apart from the driving test, of course, which is terrifying. So a familiar word for a familiar thing, theory. But when it comes to the study of literature, the word theory, for some people, takes on a frightening aspect. Mention theory to an English undergraduate, and the chances are they will grow pale, twitchy, and be unable to speak for a short while. But are they right to be scared? Well, yes, yes they are. Theory is a particularly scary business. Why? Well, a bit like Stephen Fry in his role as presenter of QI, theory is there to tell you that pretty much everything you know about literature is wrong. For example, you might think that Wordsworth wrote lovely poems about daffodils, only for a Marxist theorist to tell you that the conditions under which daffodils were produced in the Romantic period was a factor in the oppression of the rural poor, a feminist theorist to tell you that the pretty nodding heads of the yellow flowers is an image of the male poet's fantasy of silent, acquiescent blonde women. An eco-theorist to tell you that farting daffodils have blown a hole in the ozone layer. Or a psychoanalytical theorist to tell you that daffodils are in fact male genitalia and that Wordsworth was rather too fond of his sister. I'm being facetious. But I'm trying to illustrate a particular point. Theories relating to the reading and study of literature tend to focus on certain areas of interest, on things like the economic and political conditions under which literature is written, published, read, and taught, on the ways in which literary texts encourage us to think about women and men and the relationships between them, on the relationship between our understanding of literature and our awareness of the environment, on the motives which drive us to write or speak or think in certain ways of which we are not necessarily fully aware, or of which we are not in complete command. On images of ethnicity, religion, sexuality, and the ways in which they might be born of, and may even serve to spread, prejudice, intolerance, and injustice. If literature dropped from the clouds in sealed packages already complete and fully formed, if there were showers of poems, or novel blizzards, or drama downpours, or if a trough of low pressure sucked in some travel writing from the Azores, then there would be no need for theory. Literature would just be a natural phenomenon, like winds, or rivers, or tides, or Alicia Keys. But the fact is that all works of literature are produced by people with complex lives, beliefs, attitudes, ideas who have been educated by some system or another, who have political views, who dream, misbehave, lie, love, hate, eat broccoli quiche, and so on. All literature is produced under certain social, political, cultural, and economic conditions, and is therefore shaped by many forces in many ways that the writer cannot control nor even be fully aware of. And that is why theory is essential. It enables us to think about those conditions, to assess their influence, to judge their impact on the writing and the reading of literary texts, and to bring to light the concealed ideas, hidden influences, and undiscovered affinities of even the most familiar works of literature. 